Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to Ward Church. We are in the season of Advent. That word Advent literally means coming. And it's a time when we prepare for the coming of Christ at Christmas. And one of the traditions that helps us count down the days until Christmas is the Advent wreath and the Advent candles. And assisting me today are Randy and Diana Oaks. Thank you for joining me today. Today's the third Sunday in Advent. So would you please go ahead and light the third candle of the Advent wreath. In some, in some traditions, uh, the third candle is a pink color, and that, uh, that's not essential to the tradition. That comes from a medieval tradition that, uh, that compares Advent with Lent. Advent, the season right before Christmas, Lent, the season before Easter, both times of darkness, both for the Christians are a time of sacrifice and inward looking and penitence. And the idea is by week three of a dark season, we need a burst of joy. That's where that comes from. And uh, Randy and Dana, you have known seasons of darkness and you have known bursts of joy. And thanks for helping me today. We're gonna read for you once more the story of Christmas from Luke's gospel. It's a, a story you are very familiar with and I want to ask one more time, if you know this story very well, would you just please, uh, to the best of your ability, listen as if you were hearing this story for the first time. We're reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. It's on number nine. Number nine, go ahead. Try it again. Okay. Okay. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and life of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to marry to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in thanking Randy and Diana for helping us today? Thank you so much. Well, this month we are exploring the story you thought you knew. And what do we really know about Jesus? His life never seemed destined for greatness. He was born in a small, obscure town with a horrible reputation, born to an impoverished couple. He never traveled more than 200 miles from his home. He never wrote a book. He never held public office. And when he was executed, at 33 years of age, with the exception of a few family members and friends, the world didn't notice. And yet Jesus of Nazareth is arguably the central figure of human history. In fact, his life even marks our concept of time. We live in the year 2018 AD, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, and everything before that was BC, before Christ. My kids now in their history classes, sometimes historians substitute A.D. and B.C. for C.E. and B.C.E. C.E., the common era. We live in 2018 of the common era. 
and anything before that, BCE, before the Common Era. Uh, they've removed reference to Jesus. But if you asked a historian, what caused the Common Era? A historian would say, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus split our calendar of human history in two. And what do we really know about Jesus, and from where do we get our ideas? Like his physical appearance. What did Jesus look like? Everybody knows, right? He is the most painted figure in Western art. This familiar image comes from the Byzantine era. Byzantine era, that's 4th century and onward. Byzantine representations of Jesus were symbolic. They were all about meaning, not historical accuracy. So in this era, we often begin to see Jesus with a halo to communicate his divinity. We see him often in a gold toga to communicate his kingship, uh, to show his heavenly rule in his cosmic, as a cosmic king. Artists invented Jesus as a younger version of Zeus, and they used the statues of Zeus as their inspiration. Did Jesus have a beard and long hair? Maybe. Philosophers, teachers did, but many of the uh, ordinary men of that day had short hair and were clean shaven. And some of our earliest pictures of Jesus show him that way short hair, no beard. I always pictured Jesus as no hair with beard. <laughs> no, actually, the image that I have of Jesus in my mind, honestly, is probably formed from the movies I watched as a child. In 1965, the blockbuster movie, The Greatest Story Ever Told, came out. Uh, some of you are too young to know that movie. But Charlton Heston played John the Baptist. Anybody remember this? John Wayne played the centurion. Anybody seen that movie? Surely he was the son of God. You know, it was a... <laughs> and in the role, it's still a horrible, I know, a horrible... Uh, in, in the role of Jesus was cast an unknown Swedish actor. A Swede played Jesus. And the actor had, was blue-eyed and light-skinned, and he was tall, uh, a head taller than all the other actors in the film. Uh, and he, he had a British accent. All the other uh, actors were American. And he always sounded to me a little bit condescending. Oh, Peter, he would say, right? <laughs> There's not a single historical reference to the physical appearance of Jesus and nothing in the Bible that describes his physical looks. We do know that Jesus was a Mediterranean Jew and we have no reason to believe that he looked any different than any other Mediterranean Jew. His skin would have had that olive darkness to it that you still find in that region to this day. He did not speak English even King James English. And being a Mediterranean Jew also meant that he probably wasn't overly tall, most likely well under six foot. Now, not only was he not tall, but according to the ancient prophecies surrounding the coming of the Messiah, he wasn't physically impressive at all. The prophet Isaiah records this prophecy in Isaiah 53 too. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Most of what we know comes more from Hollywood than from the scriptures. Let's continue with what you thought you knew about his birthday. When was Jesus born? Is his birthday December 25? Answer, we don't know. We don't know. There's no recorded birth date anywhere. Now, we do have a good idea as to the year, just not to the day. What year was Jesus born? Think about it. Think about it. The answer should be zero, right? I did the math in my head. Should be zero. He was born somewhere around zero, the split of the calendar. Actually, most scholars believe that Jesus was born somewhere between 6 B.C. and 4 B.C., and uh, that's okay, we believe that, because Herod the Great is thought to have died in 4 B.C., the same Herod who ordered that all the baby boys under the age of two be killed in an attempt to find and take out Jesus. 
In terms of the day of the year, the Bible gives a few clues in what we read today, but frankly, none of them are all that helpful. It says that Jesus was born during a census, but we do not know when that census occurred, and a census would have taken many months to conduct. Some people believe, believe that Jesus was born in the summertime, not the winter, because the text that we read says there were shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night outside, and shepherds would do that in the summertime, but in the winter, often shepherds would be with their sheep indoors. Other people say, come on, it's not Michigan. The mild winters in Judea uh, could have the shepherds out at any time. Curiously, it appears that the birth of Jesus was not celebrated at all for the first few centuries of Christianity. Christians celebrated Easter, Resurrection Day, but gave no thought to the birthday of Jesus. The idea of celebrating the birth of Christ came much later in history, and Christmas really only became a big deal in recent centuries. So why December 25? You may have heard that December 25 coincides with a pagan Roman festival of the sun. Anybody heard that? That is true. Uh, right around this same day was the winter solstice and the ancient festival Sol Invictus, Latin for unconquerable sun, which was a festival honoring the god of Saturn. Now, some say this timing is a coincidence, that Sol Invictus and Christmas Day fall on the same day. Others say it was quite intentional that the Christians chose this day, December 25, because it already was a popular festival time in culture and to communicate to society that the pagan ways had indeed been conquered by the coming of God himself, the creator of the sun and the true light of the world. Christians were capitalizing on and redeeming their culture. And that's why December 25th was chosen. I want to say one other more recent theory that could explain why December 25th became known as Christmas Day. Less popular, equally plausible, and more simple, there is this idea in early centuries that Jesus was conceived on the same day of the year that he died. Not the same day, different years, but on the same day uh, that Jesus was conceived, he died. That was a thought in early uh, theology. The idea was that, that carried was that Jesus' conception carried with it the promise of salvation in his death. Well, we know the day that Jesus died. The Bible says it was the 14th day of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. Tertullian calculated that in the Roman calendar that would be March 25. So March 25 became recognized as the day that Jesus died and in some circles the Feast of Annunciation which celebrated the day that that angel appeared to Mary to tell her that she was going to be a great with child. March 25 was celebrated as the day that Mary conceived. And if you move forward nine months from March 25, December 25, you do the math. December 25, we, we, we don't know when Jesus was born, but December 25 seems to be as good a day as any to celebrate the birth of Christ. And does it really matter anyway? What's important is not when he came, but that he came. Read with me Paul's words to the church uh, in Galatia. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Let's read these aloud together. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. When was Jesus born? When the time set had fully come. When the time set had fully come, that's when God sent his son. Another thing you may not know about Christmas is that there were a number of ancient prophecies surrounding the coming of the Messiah the Messiah, the one that God would send to rescue his people, and that Jesus fulfilled every one of these prophecies in detail. For example, it was predicted that the Messiah would be a descendant of the house of David, of the tribe of Judah, from the family line of Jesse. And Jesus was. It was predicted by the prophet Micah that the Messiah would be born in the obscure little village of Bethlehem. 
and because of that census, Jesus was. Even little things, like the prophet Isaiah's prediction that at the birth of the Messiah, people would bring gifts, and that was fulfilled in the now famous visit of the Magi. Specific prophecies made hundreds of years earlier, not just about his birth, but about his entire life, his exact lineage, how he would be betrayed for a specific amount of money, how he would be put to death by crucifixion, how they would cast lots for his clothing, all fulfilled in the life of Jesus. People wonder, well, could that just be a coincidence? Scientist and mathematician Dr. David, uh, Dr. Peter Stoner, for, uh, former chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College, and later the chair of the Department of Science at Westmont College, calculated the odds of eight prophecies being fulfilled by chance in Jesus. If it's all just chance, what are the odds of eight prophecies being fulfilled by chance in Jesus? And he calculated the chance to be one in 10 to the 17th power. That's a one with 17 zeros behind it. I want you to see this number graphically. That's the number. Those are impossible odds. Uh, you have uh, uh, better odds of your team going to the Super Bowl. You have uh, better odds of winning the, the Powerball multiple times or being struck by lightning every other Friday. But Jesus did not fulfill eight prophecies, but all 61 of the prophecies detailed for the Messiah. Another thing you may not know about Christmas is the place, the place of birth. The nativity scene in pictures and on Christmas cards and maybe at the foot of your tree is this beautiful image of peace and serenity. Uh, gentle animals gaze lovingly down at the baby. Mary looks like her hair has just been done. Uh, Joseph looks like his robes have been freshly ironed. Everything looks clean and quaint and cozy and you can almost smell chestnuts roasting on the open fire. The real scene was not this way. The real scene was bloody and dark and dirty and chaotic. The city was already stressed out because of the census. It was overcrowded. Was Jesus born in a barn? Probably not, at least not the way we think of barns. The, the big American red barn would have been very unusual in that time and place. Most people just kept animals in their house right there with the family, sheep and goats and chickens walking around the dining room and the bedrooms and the, the living room. Uh, sometimes if they had a lot of animals, they would keep them in a cave. It was a very old tradition back to the second century. Justin Martyr uh, said that Jesus was born in a cave. Some people think he was born in a house. And it's possible this word that we translate in, no room at the inn, uh, could also be translated as a guest room. It could be there was no room in the guest room for a woman giving birth, and so Mary moved out into the main living area to have her baby, and of course, the animals were right there in the house. Whatever the case, they used a feeding trough as a bassinet. Now, we hear the word manger, and for us, that sounds all warm and fuzzy, but do not romanticize it. A manger is a feeding trough for animals. It's a feeding trough most likely made out of stone. This is a stark, sad scene. A young girl having just given birth, far from her family, in overcrowded conditions, in overcrowded conditions swaddles her own baby, no midwife available, and places him in a dirty stone trough for animals. Now you can keep your sanitized quaint and cozy image of the nativity if you want to. But let me tell you why a more earthy, historically accurate image is ultimately more hopeful. The circumstances of Jesus' birth give us a picture of God. It gives us a picture of God. The significance of Jesus is that here is God himself in human form here to reach out to his creation. So what do we learn about God from the way God entered? We learn, first of all, that God is humble. Philip Yancey writes about this. He compares God's arrival 
to the arrival of a, tip, a typical foreign dignitary. He says, you, you may have read when Queen Elizabeth visited the United States on the anniversary of the settlement of Jamestown that she brought 4,000 pounds of luggage and two outfits for every occasion. She even brought a, a grieving outfit in case someone died while she was here, 40 pints of plasma in case there was an emergency, and get this, white kid leather toilet seat covers. She also brought along her own hairdresser, two valets, and a host of other attendants. A brief visit to a foreign country can easily cost $20 million. But God emerged as a baby who could not speak or eat solid foods or control his bladder and who depended upon a poor teenage girl for shelter, food, and love. He was born among animals and placed in a stone feed truck. I love Eugene Peterson's rendering of Philippians 2, verse 6. He puts it this way, When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life. And then he died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. The other thing we learn about God in the nativity scene, in the circumstances of his birth, is that God is tilted toward the underdog. Toward the underdog. The family of Jesus knew what it was to be under incredible pressure and opposition. They were a Jewish family living under a foreign regime in an oppressive political climate. They gave birth far from home and fled a king who sought to kill him because he posed a political threat. The truth is, the experience of Jesus as a child is more like that of a Syrian refugee than that of a typical American churchgoer. In the circumstances of Jesus' birth, we see God's heart for the poor, the forgotten, the displaced, the bullied, and the vulnerable. We know this not only because of the circumstances of his death, but because of who was told the news of this birth first. When the angel went to proclaim the good news that a Savior had been born, to whom did that angel go first? A group of shepherds. And shepherds were the lowest rung of the social ladder. Nomadic, uneducated, dirty. In fact, they were so despised they were not allowed to give testimony in a court of law, ever, for any reason. That, that, that's how poorly people thought of shepherds. So the angel went first with this message to the social outcasts of that day. And that somehow seems appropriate, doesn't it? Now, make no mistake, this message was for all people. That's what the angel said. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. But it was the shepherds who had the privilege of being the first to hear and the first to respond. And the last thing we'll talk about today, the picture of God found in the way he came, is that God is courageous. Now, we don't use that term to talk about God much, but it's true. Rather than come in power, glory, and splendor, he chose to come as a fragile human being into a difficult world in the most difficult of circumstances. You know, people often get worried about our world. Think about the news headlines from this last year. Terrorism, refugees, sexual harassment, political fighting, economic uncertainty, war. And then there's our own private, often hidden circumstances. Broken relationships, family tension, shame, Messy people and messy situations. And here is the good news of Christmas. God is not afraid of any of that. Not our God. The God that was born in a cave and laid in a manger will come right in the middle of your circumstances, right in the middle of your life, no matter how messy it has got. This is a sign to you. This is what God does. This is how you'll know it's Jesus. I'm going to ask our ushers to prepare here and in Knox Hall to collect our offering. In just a moment, I'm going to pray 
And then we're going to worship God through the giving of our gifts and through the singing of a few more songs. And then, you know, we're going to go our separate ways. But please don't miss what Christmas reveals to us about our courageous God. Our God will come right in the middle of tension and chaos and fear and shame because Christmas tells us there is no place that he will not go. There is no thing he will not do. There is no depth to which he will not descend to bring God's power and God's light and God's grace and God's peace and God's goodness and God's presence to anybody who will have him. This will be a sign to you. You will find God in unlikely places. And maybe that's something we need to know about Christmas. Will you pray with me? Holy God, as we approach the end of another year, uh, we come before you as messy people who live in a messy world. How glad we are that that doesn't put you off or deter your love or your presence. Thank you for the sign given to the shepherds and to us of the kind of king that you really are. A king who will come into every situation. And now, God, we respond to the good news of Christmas the same way people have for generations, through the giving of gifts and the singing of songs. Though chaos swirls around us, Christmas tells us that all is well. For that we give thanks, and for that we pray, in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Heaven, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.